Come on in. So uh, I was just chatting with uh, Urban earlier. Urban is a grade 12 student at uh, Bishop Carroll. He's also on the volleyball team, uh, which until recently I always thought was volleyball, but it's volleyball. Uh, he's, also, uh, he's also a finishing carpenter uh, with, his, uh, with his father, and he's just a wonderful, talented, intelligent, and great, great person. So why don't you all give a big round of applause and a cheer for Urban. Welcome, welcome. So uh, just under a year ago, I was approached by my best friend, Coy MacArthur. And he sat me down one time at lunch and started talking to me about faster and light travel, which, by the way, for context, is a completely normal conversation we would have very regularly, right? So I asked him, how did you come about with such an idea? And he said, well, one day I was just biking, and I thought of something. And I rushed home, and like a painter of a paintbrush, began to paint. And in the end, I was left with this beautiful painting of math. I kindly asked him, what superhuman enhancements are you on? Which he replied, ah, you'll understand one day. After which he told me about the Beamline for Schools competition, an international competition for high school students to make up their own theory and experiment and test it on the most lucrative science facility in the world. Uh, the year before, about 150 teams applied, so it's very competitive. And if you win, you get an all expenses paid trip to Switzerland to test your theory. So our task at this point was to somehow assemble a team of students who were more than willing to under undertake this massive challenge. And hiring people for a physics project isn't exactly like recruiting for a football team. We would meet in Coy's van before school, and we put up flyers around the school asking people to join. And we actually got quite a bit res uh, interesting, res uh, quite a bit good response. And it might have been to our slogan, make physics great again, which we tried to use in light of the recent election. So we're spinning around quickly, and we hired our PR guy, Tarek, who built a website that was very focused on breaking da everything down for the public and making it easily accessible and understandable. And we wanted to be open with everything we're learning and making and being involved with. And our goal was to involve the public as much as possible and make everything accessible. And this is where the roller coaster ride really began. We had our first meeting, which was like stepping in the boxing ring of Mike Tyson. We just got uppercut and fell on our backs flat and just completely knocked out. Because we covered light topics such as uh, special relativity, quantum mechanics, particle physics, and quantum field theory. Not your everyday uh, high school subjects here. To say we were under, uh, unqualified is an understatement. So left dumbfounded, every member was questioning, like, why did I sign up for this? Like, I don't understand any of this. This is completely over my mind. But somehow, whether we were stubborn or genuinely curious, we stuck around. So it was around February, while preparing for a CTV interview, that the project really began to take life for me personally. I was starting to better understand all the math and physics behind our theory. More importantly, however, I began to see the artistry in it all, and the project really started to come to life. Through learning these fantastic concepts, I began to see a better picture of our cosmos. Each little piece of my knowledge grew more and more, and it was this new understanding that I've carried on from here on. Even though we didn't win the competition, our team split apart. Uh, me and my friends, who couldn't be here today because they're at the University of Waterloo, decided we wanted to continue on building what we've learned and try to explore what we all wish, try to explore more what we have uh, learned and try to communicate it all and articulate to you here tonight. Now, I've been talking and describing this theory for quite a long time, and some of you probably care to know exactly what it is. And as you can see, it's just basic algebra, guys, okay? It's nothing too complicated. So let's begin. To start, you might be familiar with Newton's second law, F equals MA, which is used to describe the relationship between mass, acceleration, and force. 
but it also describes how force acts the same way in all objects. Using this little bit of knowledge, we start to play around a bit. In physics, there are four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and strong nuclear force. And each of these have properties, we'll call them, just for simplicity, uh, that dictate how the force acts on an object. So mass is unique in the sense that it is only one of these properties that, can re that relates to energy. As shown by the famous equation that you've all probably seen before, equals mc squared, what this means is mass and energy are equivalent. They are two sides to the same coin, essentially. So we decided to investigate mass. So going back to F equals MA, if all forces act the same, it only makes sense to model them like gravity. Like, I can't believe you guys haven't thought of this yet already. Um, and this is because in the gravitational formula, there's the variable for mass, so it's the only one we can kind of use to manipulate to solve for mass. So doing the math, we find that the properties of the weak interaction and electromagnetism, which are called charge and isospin, uh, are what can be thought of as imaginary mass. And this was what we planned to test at CERN, that, that whether charge and isospin are what can make up imaginary mass in our theory. Now, just to give a little context here, we don't just pull us out of our butts and just write equations on the wall and call it math, right? We take already known theories that are known very well to be very much true, and we build off of them. We explore how can they be interpreted in different ways and what we can learn from them. And it's this where the artistry kind of comes into play, playing around these equations and formulas and concepts and trying to figure out what else they can mean. So we have arrived at the end of our calculations to find that charge and isospin relate to imaginary mass. All of you are probably wondering, what the hell is imaginary mass? Like, I've never heard of it before, right? So we have to describe what uh, an imaginary number is in mathematics. Now, if you guys can try and think hard back to high school mathematics, you might have been told that if you take the square root of a negative number, that you cannot do that. Well, you've been lied to, okay? You can do that, and it's defined as an imaginary number, or i in this case. It's an extension of our real number system that exists beyond real numbers. Basically, it's a number that is not real, but is real because it exists. However, its very definition means it can't be real. So basically, it's a no real number that's not real. If you're still confused, the short answer is don't think about it. This is why charge and isospin can be thought of as imaginary mass. They are negative values that when we take the square root of, become imaginary. So from here, we begin to extrapolate. We look at the relativistic equation for energy. This is part of Einstein's work. Uh, and the denominator describes how anything with real mass cannot travel faster than light. If we look at the v squared over c squared, that always has to be equal to or less than one. And if it's uh, equal to one, it means something with no mass can travel faster than the speed of light. Oh, the speed of light, sorry. And it's, it's because of this that nothing in our current understanding of physics can go faster than light. However, if, um, if, you make it, if you make the mass imaginary here, it cancels out basically, and we have just found a fa uh, p uh, plausibility for faster than light travel. Now, this concept is not new, and there are many theories to overcome these boundaries. There's stuff like Alcubierre drives and other things that try to get around this uh, limitation. But what we found in our theory is, uh, is can be described as tachyon particles, which are theoretical particles that have already been thought of before that can travel faster than light, and their property is um, having imaginary mass. So that's what we um, discovered here. But faster than light travel is only the beginning. The implications get crazier from here, like time travel. And you might be saying, what is this guy talking about? This guy's crazy. All right, so to get to here, we use the same type of transformation that Einstein used in a special theory of relativity that is called the Lorentz transformation. From here, we did some work to make it complex. Now, complex is also a mathematical term for something that has real and imaginary parts, something like five plus I five. So it has an imaginary part and a real part. 
So we make it complex, and we add in some uh, complex uh, velocity calculations we did previously in our theory to it. And this gives us a new way of looking at time, in our theory at least. And so in our theory, time is complex. So as a real and imaginary part. So for us, nothing changes. We're still traveling through real time. Everything's the same, right? Now what changes is that in the complex time equation, uh, real time is negative for tachyon particles. So basically, tachyons travel backwards through real time, backwards through our time. So in a sense, they are time traveling to the past. Now, I may have ever over-exaggerated this a bit because it's only a tachyon particle that can travel backwards in time, which has imaginary mass, and I'm here, I'm real, I'm not imaginary, so I can't travel backwards in time, but it technically counts. So from here, uh, our implication of tachyon particles uh, get even crazier. This is probably the most craziest thing we've learned from looking at this math. And some of you might be screaming in your heads, how is this possible? But just l let me ramble for a little bit. We'll be able to create energy out of nothing, basically. And you, all you guys are probably screaming, or those of you who understand at least, that violates the uh, law of conservation of energy. In our case, not quite. We're just merely asking which law is more fundamental. So when we were doing the math, we examined how energy works in an infinite velocity tachyon. And we find an interesting relationship. As velocity of a tachyon approaches infinity, the energy approaches zero, all right? So from here, we decided, oh, it might be interesting to examine momentum. F but for momentum, as the velocity of an infinite velocity tachyon approaches um, infinity, it approaches a non-zero value. That means infinite velocity tachyons have momentum. So here we have a conundrum, so to speak. We have, um, we're put it against the law of conservation energy and the law of conservation momentum and ask which one is more important to be preserved in physics. And for the purposes to make things interesting and for our theory, we decided to explore what happens if momentum is conserved instead of energy. We don't quite know which one is right, both could be equally wrong or right, but it's fun to examine the possibilities. So if momentum can be conserved, we will have infinite velocity tachyons decaying into other infinite velocity tachyons and real particles. And this would create an infinite amount of infinite velocity ta uh, tachyons creating an infinite amount of real particles. Basically, energy for nothing. <laughs> the, the implications from this are quite crazy, so to speak. There's a lot of things that you can do when you have energy for free from basically nothing. <coughs> creating universes. Um, but what I've already said has probably confused your mind quite a bit, and um, we'll move on from here. So at this point, you might have found what I have said a little bit interesting or just completely flew over your head. That's all right. Either way, it doesn't matter because my goal here was to illustrate how uh, mathematics and physics is much more artistic field than people care to imagine, right? We you manipulate these formulas, you look at these concepts, and you try to think and extrapolate them in certain ways people have never thought before. And this opens a realm of infinite possibilities of what can and can't be. And even if something doesn't seem, doesn't be, isn't proven to be true, that's just one possibility we've eliminated off the giant spectrum, bring us that much closer to the truth. And to quote the man, Coy, who came up with much of the math of this. Mathematics is the greatest invention of humankind. When applied to physics, one can alo sit alone in a room and predict the future, explain the past, and conceptualize the unobservable. Mathematics, in all its practical use, stems from our creativity, and those aware of this are able to view the universe in ways nobody has before. Not everything is discovery. In mathematics, an idea can be true because you define it to be true. Regardless of how the universe works, we can't even describe the systems outside of the workings of the universe. Little too many, there lies an infinite realm of truths waiting to be discovered and created within every mind. The only trick, unlocking what is already there. So for me, 
Hey, my friends at Waterloo, this is what powers our next project and our future endeavors. This goal and this mission to spread this message and explore these new possibilities, to paint a picture of the universe using math. Thank you. Now at this time, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. If you want to maybe clar so clarify some things that I didn't explain so well, the floor is yours. Uh, we are not, like we wanted to test this, but we didn't win the competition. Actually, another team from Canada won, from Ontario. Um, they were doing something with uh, fractional charges, I can't remember. But uh, we would have tested uh, whether charge and isospin can be thought of as imaginary mass. So, um, early in the presentation you saw this giant formula of like this square root of a square root of a square root, right? And what we would have done, we would have gone to CERN measure like uh, velocity, momentum, range, and some other values, I believe. Plug them into the formula and see if the inequality holds true. And if it did, that means our theory cannot be ruled out. Like there's a possibility of this existing. And then all the stuff that we, I talked about there, like the tachyons traveling backwards through time and the creating energy of nothing is just implications of if these tachyon particles existed. Um, I've thought about it. I want to. Um, I'm gonna have to see, really. Uh, I know Koi is definitely on board. He's kind of a physics nerd, so he'll do anything that involves math and equations. Uh, it's all, uh, I have to get together a team again, which uh, there were some struggles with it, with like school balance and this, because it took up a lot of time to try and understand it on a somewhat of a level. But I've not ruled it out yet. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure it would go to infinite numbers, from what I can recall. Um, like, this is not my math, so if you guys have any questions about like the real nitty gritty, I would advise contacting Koi. I can give you his contact information. But from what I remember, it would it would travel at infinite velocity or approach infinite values, and that's why we can kind of extrapolate the. Uh, Zero, it was zero energy, but it would have some momentum because we use, uh, for any of you who've taken calculus, we just took a limit of uh, as velocity approaches infinity and found that for energy it approaches zero and for momentum it approaches a non zero value. Yes? Oh, I've, I've already known I wanted to pursue science as a cure to begin with. Uh, I just saw this project as a fantastic opportunity to explore this realm of theoretical physics, which I never really quite understood. Like I was starting to like dip my toe in it a little bit and try to understand more because I, I was I'm gunning more for the engineering route, right? But I feel like if you if you uh, strive to become just one thing, you miss out on so much more that there is, right? So I could be the best engineer in the world. But if I don't have a clue of all these other things that account for and I can use for inspiration, then I can only go so far, right? So my goal is to try and acquire as much knowledge as possible from everywhere, like even just from playing sports and whatnot, to try and become the best individual. And I saw this as an opportunity to build on that. Anything else? Yeah, I'll, I'll be here for like, I don't know, when does the night end? <laughs> I'll be here till like 10 o'clock so you guys can ask me about anything. If you want to get in contact with Koi and ask him some real mathy questions. So yeah. Hey, thank you so much. No worries. Thank you guys.